Another important question, we always have important questions on this programme, would you prefer life without sex? New research suggests there's a growing number of people who are happy to be asexual, that is, they're capable of being aroused but never feel the impulse to do anything sexual with another person. So tonight we're asking why more of us are choosing to live without sex. Is it because we don't have the urge, or because we don't need the hassle and the baggage that goes with it? And we'd like you to tell us what you prefer to sex. Is it a cup of tea, like Boy George? Um, and if you're quite happy to go through life without having sex, get in touch. Same numbers, 85058. You can email bannister at bbc.co.uk, or call that free phone number 0500 909 693. Um, joining us on the line is Dr Anthony Bogart, a uh, psychologist at Brock University in Canada. He's published the first study attempting to estimate how widespread asexuality is. And in the studio with us, 18-year-old gap year student Ben Kennedy is here. He's a member of AVEN, the Asexual Visibility and Education Network, of which more in a moment. Uh, also joining us, Philip Hodson, a fellow of the British Association for Counselling and Psychotherapy. Um, let's start with you, Dr. Bogart. Um, can you explain how you discovered this phenomenon of asexuality? Was it, uh, was it a piece of research you set out to do, or was it by accident? Um, hello. Um, uh, a bit of both, I guess. Um, I was interested in studying sexual orientation. Uh, basically what are the factors associated with uh, making a person gay, straight, or bisexual. And I knew there wasn't much research on people who didn't really fit into that category or those categories, so I thought it might be interesting to go into an existing database, an existing study that had already been conducted, and examine the prevalence rate of people who report having no attraction for men or women or, or anyone at all. Mm. They, they're, they're the kind of people who tick the box none of the above, are they? Sorry? They're the kind of people who tick the box none of the above That's when you right, ask them. That's the none of the above people. Um, and so there was, in this particular sample, which was a representative sample of Britain, about 1% indicated that, you know what, I'm not interested in having sex with men, women, anyone. And so they report having no sexual attraction to anyone at all. And this is not about uh, dysfunction, physical dysfunction, in the sense of, you know, people who are impotent or uh, suffer from other physical manifestations. This is um, entirely about it, mental um, choice. It's hard it? to say. Some people who report being asexual may have um, corresponding health considerations that make them report that they have no attraction, but the research that I conducted suggested that um, a fair proportion of the people who report being asexual didn't have health-related issues or health-related problems. So it may be a kind of combination answer that um, perhaps for some people it may be um, that they have health conditions that make them less interested in sex um, because of those health conditions, but it, it may be the case that there are a significant portion of people who um, don't have any health-related problems, at least visibly, that we can tell and are still not interested in or not having, or at least not, or at least do not report having attraction for men, women, or anyone at all. So okay, well, let's bring in Ben Kennedy. Uh, I mentioned that you're a member of uh, a group called AVEN, the yeah. Asexual Visibility and Education Network. Um, what does that do? What's the aim of it? Well, it's just a, uh, a forum to get for asexual people to meet, uh, to talk to each other, and just to, um, and for people that wondering about it to come and have a look and see what it is and see if they are if they need help there's a help every it's a very very friendly community mm. and and uh, are there a lot of people who are members of it is there's it a, a widespread community it, it's about 1300 members we've got at the moment uh it's from all around the world we've got we've got uh, foreign um forums for for different speaking languages it's not very popular that most people speak uh english and it, they, there's people from Belgium that I know of, and France, and Canada, America, Britain, South Africa, Australia, many places. When did you realise that you were asexual? Is it something that crept up on you, or is it something you've always felt? Well, I, I, I realised when I was, uh, last January, I was, I was going through a, a bout of depression, and I was wondering about myself, and I just came across Avon on, uh, on the website, and I found that's what I am. Mm because I, I haven't had a girlfriend before and I thought at school oh I haven't I haven't got a girlfriend that means I must be gay but uh, I didn't think well I'm not attracted to men or boys so but uh, 
I've, I haven't really been attracted to anyone really. Mm. You, you don't think it's just a phase you're going through? I mean, some people will say you're only 18, you've yeah. got plenty of time to explore your sexuality, you know, maybe you're just a bit of a late developer and you'll, you'll grow into it. No, I don't think so. There's a, you, you, you get a feeling that you, you're sure about this. You're not, it's not going to change. You don't, you don't, there isn't a small inkling. Well, for me anyway, there's, some people just have very low libidos. And, uh, but no, I feel like it's permanent. And, and do all the members of AVEN report a similar phenomenon that they've never really been interested in having a sexual relationship with another person or have some of them gone off it well um well a long time ago i was i was sexual but that that kind of faded out and there's a lot of people like that some there's some people who've been asexual all their life they haven't experienced sexual attraction at all ever but there is some that uh, have grown out of it it's a say if mm. going up in a in years. <laughs> Do Dr. Bogart, do, do you think this is a, um, a recognisable condition or do you think it's something that comes around from uh, the sort of conditioning that people go through in society? Um, it, it's interesting. The, the study that I conducted, there's no real firm conclusions about what causes it, if that's what you're asking. Mm. About. Um, it may be social, cultural, environmental kinds of factors that influence um, people's sexual attraction, or there may be as well biiological factors that may contribute to it. Um, More work is needed, presumably. For each individual. Right. So let's bring in Philip Hodson, um, who is a fellow of the British Association for Counselling and Psychotherapy. Hello, Philip. Hello, Matthew. How are you? Oh, very well, thanks. Good to have you on again. Thank you. Um, do you recognise this condition? Well, I was listening to Ben very hard, and what he said was interesting when he said he'd been depressed, because one of the key symptoms of depression is loss of libido. I also share your view that 18 is a little early to conclude the rest of your sexual history, although I understand what he means when he says, um, I feel strongly this way, it's becoming an identity. Well, perhaps that's partly because he's joined a group which reinforces that identity. So I would keep, or I would urge... Ben to keep a bit more of an open mind. Mm, he's, he's shaking his head. I know. You, I know. Yeah. Come back, Ben, and talk to Philip. Well, I, I I'm not. I, I'm not. Uh, Avon isn't just my friends. I've got a lot mm. of friends, and okay. they're all they're all sexual, and uh, I don't feel. I, I feel at ease with them, but I just don't feel. I don't say I'm asexual. That's it. It's just. It's just open. And what's their reaction? Well, I've told. Well, I, I tell them if they if they want to know or need to know, mm. um, and some of them don't know what it is. I was surprised when one of one of my friends said, "Oh, asexual like uh, S Stephen Fry," which I I don't know if he is. Mm. Well, well, Stephen Fry was celibate for a time. He's you changed his mind about since. It. <laughs> <laughs> but he has changed his mind, absolutely. Yeah. Um, I knew, look, I knew a woman who was what you would call asexual until she was 43. Mm. And that was despite deciding to get married for stability and having children gritting her teeth the, through the process of getting pregnant. Then she fell in love for the first time ever at 43, and she quote, this is the quote she gave me, I found myself doing in cars all over London things I would never have dreamed of. <laughs> so you, right. think, you think you think you could be cured, do you, Philip, I of being asexual? I wouldn't medicalise it and talk about cures. I would say life is full of curved balls. Right, okay, go ahead. You, you've got to be on this. All of my alarm bells ring when I hear psychotherapists talking about sexual identity. If you look at the history of the development of sexual identity, particularly the development of gay identity, when gay people first started talking about being gay, you know, this was considered a freakish and absurd thing. No, the idea that you would have, a hundred years later, people just accepting that it was a settled identity seemed ridiculous. And of course, psychotherapy, really, only in the last 20 years, has stopped treating homosexuality as an abnormality. If you look at transsexuality, it's exactly the same. The idea of a transsexual didn't exist 45 years ago. This is a new and developed identity. And I think Ben's being incredibly brave. You always have, particularly for someone of his age, that you, you I think this is very, this must be incredibly difficult and painful. And I know I'm gay, and I know that certainly at Ben's age, I would not have been as, as brave as he is about talking about my homosexuality, and that's a much more socially accepted and understood phenomenon. I can perfectly well imagine a time 50 years from now where asexuality is a minority but fairly common phenomenon and parents will be told, you know, in the same way that parents 50 years ago, if my father had gone, I mean, my father's not gay, but if my father had gone to his parents and said, I'm gay, they would have reacted with horror and incomprehension. In the I, same I, way I imagine Ben's parents may have reacted yeah. that way now, but they won't, you know, I, I because don't, of people can I, like can Ben. I say, can I say, hey, can I say, I don't, come in for I don't dispute a word of that. I just said, all I said was, it's not psychotherapist labelling, because I'm not labelling. 
labeling. I'm trying to resist the label. I'm saying, let's see what happens, because um, we've been talking about asexuality as an identity really only for four or five years. Mm. Um, it comes around. It, it, it cropped up in a Guardian poll three years ago and Sunday Times before that. It's a journalist story as well, and they like it very much. Sure, but I think talking of cures or people growing... I didn't it was me, it was me to be fair, no, 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 said I cure, totally, it told me not to. I totally accept that, but, but Philip, I think... I, I'm very aware that, uh, I think you'll know this as well, that exactly the same things that you're saying were said to the first wave of gay pioneers. Now, it may be that you're right, but I think you can understand why alarm bells would go there's off. A, there's a slightly different thing, though, isn't there, Johan, here? Because what we're talking about is a group of people who may not be experiencing the same thing uh, in asexuality. Sure. The, the doctor who from, from Canada who was describing his research is talking about a, a range of different factors, and he's not yet been able well, to pin down why it, why it happened. And of course, the we're only talking, aren't we? Hang on. Yeah, we're also talking, aren't we, about what we broadly call celibacy. It, you know, there are many uh, reasons why people don't have sex, and often it's that life defeats them. Okay, Dr. Bogart, you wanted yeah. to come in. Um, I, I would like to make a distinction between um, how I categorize asexuality and, and celibacy. Okay. Um, they certainly can be overlapping. Um, the research I conducted really looked at. Um, I guess an intrapsychic or attraction and so I asked people or I didn't ask people but I, I reanalyzed data that suggested that that people can report having no attraction for uh, men women or, or but, anyone at all but you don't know why but I don't know why but celibacy is, is a behavior right and so people can choose to engage in sexual behavior or not engage in sexual behavior and still have lots of attraction for men or women or both and so or not or not yes that's um, the point but, but, um, but, no, but Philip hang on a second because I think Dr. Bogart is trying to identify uh, uh, this is probably two overlapping groups isn't it that there'll be those who have chosen to be celibate but mm. are strongly attracted to either men or women or, 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 or whatever <laughs> um, and then there'll be those who have uh, feel asexual uh, who have no attraction to anybody at all and maybe there's some people in the middle uh, you know who, who, who overlap between the two groups but, I, I think that does make sense to put it in that way and so to recognize some of the diversity there but to also make a distinction between people who report having no attraction and people who choose not to have sex for example you know priests or, mm -hmm. or or because of religious convictions they may still feel attraction to males or females but they ultimately uh, choose not to for various reasons mm. and Philip are you aware of people who choose not to have sex uh, not for religious reasons but just because they can't be bothered because they find the whole thing a bit messy and a bit disgusting and they'd rather not go through life doing it well, well, <laughs> well, we yeah. don't know. But, you know, um, if, it's, if it's messy and disgusting, then that's experience and that's aversion. So life has put them off. There are many people who can't be fagged. But then we come back to the question of why. And I want to introduce a couple of other ideas. I mean, I've talked about depression. One of the major symptoms of depression, and we have an epidemic of that, is lack of libido. We also are, were told throughout North America and increasingly in Europe, we have an epidemic of obesity. And one of the major consequences of obesity is often a fall in libido. We also have a polluted environment, which apparently is turning men into women. And, you know, there is a significant relationship between the loss of key sex hormones in the menopause and the drive for sex. And I'm just wondering whether these factors ought to be borne in mind. Mm. So, so you think they may be contributory? Do Dr. Bogart? Yes. Uh, well, I do uh, keep them in mind in terms of this particular study. Again, I, as I was suggesting earlier in the program, there is some evidence of health-related issues can are related to asexuality. And so, uh, not in every case, but there is some evidence that uh, people with sort of atypical physical development and health conditions do yeah. report, on average, uh, well, having less attraction to and, and maybe maybe that's the way we live as well in the sense that um, I know from the consulting room that many couples who've got children and demanding jobs really only have good sex or good sex when they're on holiday mm. let, me, let me just ask Ben about this because you mentioned depression as one of the yeah. uh, factors in your life um, did you feel as Philip is suggesting that the depression was in some way linked to being asexual? No, not at all. I was, I, I know I was asexual before my depression hit me, many years before. A lot of asexual people have been depressed. Yeah. You said you were sexual at one point. I was sexual when a long time that? ago. That was in my preteens. 
In your preteens? Yes. So you'd be, what, how, what age would you say that was? Well, nine, nine ten. Nine, ten. Yeah. And, and who are you attracted to? Well, just kind of anything, really. <laughs> <laughs> Both males and females? Well, no, I, I can't really remember, but I don't think I was attracted to males. I was just, well... And can I ask yeah. you a delicate question <laughs> about sex with yourself? Is that a f feature of your life? No, no, not, not at really. all. No. You, you're, you, I mean, is anything but else? I hope you don't mind answering these questions. No, I don't mind. Quite happy well, you, because you know this is quite a personal <laughs> interrogation that you're going through here. So if you wanted to stop at any point, no, you I'm can fine. say so. Uh, well, but if you want to ask another question, Philip, you may. Well, I'm just wondering if there's anything else that really dominates your life and gives you a sense of fascination and and complete interest apart from uh, you know Avon. Well, no, well, I, I I'm very active socially. Yeah. I've got lots of friends. I'm I'm yeah. passionate about mountain boarding. It's right. Right. And um, okay. kiteboarding and other things like that. I, Let me give you some figures. The, we haven't got any good data on asexuality in yeah. this country. We've got a couple of subjective polls. There was a Guardian one, there's a Sunday Times one. The Guardian one said this, the average Briton has sex eight times a month. Although this figure does not include the 23% of Britons who do not have any sex in an average month at all. <laughs> mm. And you've got... But that, hang on a second, Philip, that's different from being asexual, isn't it? Because for all sorts of reasons, people might not have sex. You know, well, we uh, don't know, do we? I mean, if 23% of people don't have sex in an average month, do they have any sex at all? Right. Uh, difficult, these statistics, aren't they? I just, I just want to get Amina Taylor's view on, on this. Um, f first of all, do you, do you recognise this, this condition as one that you, you've seen people with, or have you had experience of people who have who've gone through this? Not at all. This is completely new to me, and I... I understand what Jan is saying where, you know, we look at things now with great fascination whilst they become something of the norm later on, you know, after being studied and analysed to death. If somebody feels as if they're not attracted to anybody, what's what's the big deal? I don't understand why it sounds... We're, we're always bombarded with images that we have to be getting it on, we've got mm. to be getting some with somebody <laughs> yeah. at any which way, any given time, and mm. what if... There are just some people who I'm only don't. asking questions. Mm. I refuse to pathologize it. I don't like the word cure because there isn't a disease. Right. And anybody can make any lifestyle choice they want. Sure. I think one other thing that's very interesting is that 20 years ago, people like Ben wouldn't have met each other. Partly the formation of these new identities yeah. is linked to the internet. Yeah, absolutely. Mm. And it's this amazing phenomenon. Yeah. And you yeah. see this with lots of kind of, spe if you like, specialist sexual groups that people wouldn't have even had a concept existed. You know? Yeah. You've got can one I just hang on a second? I just want to ask Ben another question. I mean, was it a difficult decision, as it were, to come out in the way that, you know, um, it's difficult for some people who are homosexual mm. to come out? Was it difficult for you to it make it public? Partly because, um, the, the society I'm, I'm in is very, um, if it's not heterosexual, it's, it's, so there's something, there's going to be something wrong, something's happened, there might be medically, but, um, it's not, it's not as alarming to some, uh, I would say, well, if, if you're being, if you said I'm gay, they might think, oh, you might be attracted to me, I'm going to steer clear of them, but if you say I'm not attracted to anyone, it's not much of a, uh, they, they don't, they go, oh, okay. No. Fine. People don't they react don't, they don't mind. In, in any way. They no. don't have a sort of pro or anti no. reaction. What, what, what about your family? Have they had a reaction about it? Um, I'm not. Sh I'm not sure. My dad was very keen on it because <laughs> he he's seen he's he's brought up Catholic and it seems not right to be uh, anything but heterosexual. But uh, my mum initially thought there must be something wrong. You got you got to send him to the doctor as there blockages or has he got low testosterone or things like that. But uh, I told her but I actually I actually led her to the website and it, it's got a uh, information part for parents that explains it and she seemed much much it more at ease after that. Mm. And and is there a, a great deal of uh, comfort to be had, if you like, from joining the community of other people who are in a similar situation? Presumably it must have been great news when you found that you weren't the only one. Yes, yes, because you, you, you think you're the only one. Pers uh, everyone, I think, I've, I've met uh, uh, through Avon thought that at once, because you've got everyone that is sexual, uh, it's, it's obvious they're going out with people, they said I'm attracted to these people, but you feel like you, you, you aren't saying, oh, I'm not attracted to anyone, because you're in a sexual society, you're supposed to be sexual, you're supposed to think that, um, oh, the, if, if, if I haven't been attracted to one, there might be someone later on that I might be attracted to, I, I'm, I, there's, I have to be either You just haven't found the right person yet, yeah. is the kind of comment, presumably, that people make, yeah. is it? Um, well, do you, do you never kind of feel that that might be 
No, not True. at all. Because uh, you, you, surely with some people you might think, oh, she's slightly attractive or... But you don't. There's, 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 no, there's nothing of that at all. So there can't be... You really wouldn't think that if you're finding absolutely no one at all attractive sexually... Ben, do you, ben, do you still person. live at home? I do, yes. Mm. And would you... I mean, you say you have a wide s sort of social network and stuff, but do you feel you have your own life yet or not? How do you mean by that? Well, uh, when, when one moves out of home, leaves home, very symbolic sort of rite of passage, isn't it? When you yeah. get your own place, when you can decide all the rules of your life. Yeah. Or, or do you feel you're still very much, as it were, having to relate to the, your parents' values? Oh, no. I, I feel... I, I, f I feel like a wholesome person. I wasn't, I wasn't saying you weren't a wholesome person, <laughs> but I was saying, do you... Yeah, I mean, when I lived at home till I was, you know, 21, I still had to toe the line. Yeah, but no, I, am. Um, yeah, no. Well, it sounds to me, Philip, as though uh, Ben's got a pretty much a mind of his own. If he's mm. gone to his parents and said something that they might not have yep. found yeah. very comfortable. Yeah. Uh, let's just read a few of these texts out. Okay. Um, well, Kate, what have you got there? Uh, these are, um, f this is from Bill in Aberystwyth, sorry. Following a messy separation three years ago, I chose to have little or no sex. I've got used to it. I read and you can't beat a good trollop at bedtime. <laughs> oh, <laughs> yes. The old jokes are the best one, aren't they? I've got this from Mark on the M6. It says, a long, hot, soapy bath is better than sex. Um, a good, any, any there, um, Amiga? Ken in Aylesbury say, why be asexual? Just get married and after a while, it's the same thing. <laughs> uh, yeah, that, another one on that theme, Richard in Cambridge says, re no sex. I'm not willing to go through life without having sex, but my wife is. Boom, boom. <laughs> Uh, yeah, a guy here is emailed saying, I'm asexual, but not for want of trying. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Graham in North Yorkshire. Sir Isaac Newton was reputedly a lifelong virgin, he says. An apple may have dropped, but the penny didn't. <laughs> uh, a couple more from you, Amina. Well, uh, on uh, somebody being quite... Mm. No sex for nearly 12 years. The last girl broke my heart and not allowing a female to get close to me. It's funny, but I just don't miss the sex. Just the last girlfriend. Oh, <laughs> well, that's sad, isn't it? That is really sad. Um, oh. And uh, sorry to hear about that. Kate, what have you got? From Terry, age 63. Sex two times a night at my age is better than TV, beer and football. Magic sex. <laughs> right, <laughs> so, well, there's life beyond 60. I'm glad to hear it. OK, we'll continue this conversation in just a moment. And, of course, if you want to join in, banister at bbc.co.uk or 850 on the text, or you can ring us on 0500 909 693. Just after 10.30 now. Thank you very much indeed, Bassos. It's Matthew Bannister with you on Five Live, 24 minutes to 11. Um, and we're talking about uh, what might be a new type of sexuality gaining prominence, people who describe themselves as asexual. Um, and with us to talk about that, Philip Hodson, fellow of the British Association for Counselling and Psychotherapy, 18-year-old gap year student Ben Kennedy, who's convinced he is asexual, um, and Dr Anthony Burgett, a uh, psychologist at Brock University in Canada, who's published the first study attempting to estimate the prevalence of asexuality. Uh, Dr Burgett, before we go any further, could I just ask if there were more men or women who described themselves as not being attracted to, uh, to anyone in your survey? It was more women who indicated that they didn't have attraction to anyone at all. By, by a large percentage or...? Um, by a significant percentage and so uh, from a statistical point of view um, I could tell that this was uh, a relatively large gap between them. Um, but there were certainly a, a fair number of, of men who indicated that they were asexual as well and so I don't want to give the impression that it was only women. Okay. Um, let's talk to Christina O'Doni, a former editor of the Catholic Herald, now deputy editor of the New Statesman. She's actually putting together an article on this subject for this Sunday's Observer. Hello Christina. Hello. Um, do you believe that the phen phenomenon exists, first of all, that it is a recognizable condition? Uh, yes, I absolutely do, but I have to say I, I really disagree with Philip's take on it, which is that life defeats them, I, I, I heard him say. Some, and, not all. Well, no, 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 but I thought that that was a very interesting um, observation because what I think is going on is, is what Ben said, which is you're supposed to be sexualized in this society. And that is the thing. You know, asexual people are rebelling against one of the greatest mm. taboos in our society, mm. which is if, yeah. if you don't um, have sex, you are no one. Let me get it absolutely clear. I'm not going to say much more, but I, I, I am saying there is a, if you like, a bell curve of the distribution of libido. It's perfectly normal for there to be a very few people in general who want almost no sex and I think we've got 1,300 on the website so far worldwide as opposed to the gazillion websites obsessed with sex. 
and there's a it's perfectly normal at the other end of the curve for there to be a very few people who want sex ten times a day most of us fall in the middle that's mm. my position Christina that seems fair enough isn't it I think that's fair enough mm. however I think that what is very interesting with all of Philip's arguments about asexuality is that he tries to understand this phenomenon as though it were an oddity, as though it were something that ought to be cured. He no, tried to find no, I didn't. I said the opposite. I said it's not <laughs> pathologizing, and I'm not using the word cure. That was M. Bannister's word, copyright, sole prop, not <laughs> all right, me. All right, all right. But uh, you did try to find lots of physical reasons. I'm curious. I'm curious, and I want to know more. That's yeah. all. No, 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 no. And I'm curious, and I, and I have gotten to know a lot more, because when I was editor of the Catholic Herald, I have to tell you, I knew a lot of people who were asexual by choice. Me too, 30 you, years in the consulting you, are you, are you, Hang on, Christina, and but are you talking about a, a lot of celibate priests? I'm talk to, talking about a lot of celibate priests, or, or at least pre priests who were supposed to be celibate, and I hope they were, and they certainly <laughs> talked as though they were, no, and no, they that, all that, said, and I thought this was very interesting, they all said, sex is fine, but there is a higher purpose to life. And when they said that, I remember, you know, I would think, gosh, you know, this is absolutely a shock because we are led to believe that sex is the be-all and the end-all. It's the alpha and the omega of our existence. And it, we're led to believe that not only by um, a sexual consultants, but also by sex in the city. We're also led to believe it by Ooh. everything from... Let me just ask a question because um, we're surely led to believe it by what you might call natural selection or by the, the, the laws of nature that we are are in a way hardwired to reproduce. Yeah, but that, reproduce I mean that, that's what that's what leads us to believe it first, doesn't it? Yes, but but that that's all very well. But then there's you know how do you explain homosexuality? That is nothing to do with re reproduction, and yet there's a, a huge well, there's a uh, number of homosexuals all over the place. There's a and new argument based on physical evidence that it actually increases the chances of the relatives of homosexuals to have more children, and that's uh, because the same chemical stimulates their fertility that. Uh, as it were, helps to produce whatever it is is meant by partially a gay gene. Mm -hmm. yeah, no, no, we're drawing away from, from the purpose of this argument, which is to explain away asexual. I agree mm -hmm. with you, Christina. I think there are many people who, for ideological and other reasons, as well as just how they feel, are mm. not very interested in sex. Don't. I've got two quotes. One is, I love my husband dearly and have never looked at anyone else. Although we've been celibate for the past 15 years, my ambition is to be married for the rest of my life. That's one. And the other is a, a quote I treasure from, a, from an episode of Morse. And it says, um, Morse, a lady of a certain age replied, it happens so rarely, Chief Inspector, one never forgets the time or place. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and you want to come in on this. I know Christina's written a lot as well about how we project sexuality onto children. And this is and I think it's true that we we find asexual things very difficult. And I read the, the New Scientist article this morning about asexuality. And I was trying as I came here and as I left work to, to just go around imagining that there were no sexual, I felt no sexual impulses. And actually, so much of our society is structured on it that it was mm. almost like... You're totally right. Yeah. yeah. I mean, You're you know, totally whether it's advertising, you want to buy sugar, yeah. Yeah. you know, here's a picture of a half-naked man. You yeah. buy, <laughs> and it did, does yeah. make you realise how how sexualized we are. I don't know if that's mm. a good yeah. or bad thing, but I think it's why a lot of people will find it very hard to understand Ben and why actually I think he has a harder struggle in many ways, asexuals have a harder struggle, than gay people. Yeah. Christina, you think that in, in some ways uh, people like Ben are standing up against that onslaught of sexuality which is, which is coming from the media, which is coming from advertising, which is coming Absolutely. from... Absolutely. I think uh, that they're the rebels we need to remind us that we've become obsessed with something that is is basic and, and actually quite banal. I mean, you know, as, mm. as we said, oh, all the on, birds are banal. And, and it's fun, but there's not, you know... <laughs> <laughs> it may be fun, Maybe but banal it's still banal. House, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, ben, I've heard a text here from David in London who wants me to ask you a question he says ask him about love will he ever mm. experience love heartache etc yes do you think you will yes there's uh, there's many different types of love what only one of them is romantic or sexual I've I love my friends I've got um I, I I'm also a romantic but not a romantic but a romantic yes <laughs> but um a lot of asexuals aren't a lot of asexuals are romantic so they they want um romantic relationships but they just don't want the sex mm. so so would you for example want eventually to get married to somebody i don't feel the urge at the moment but 
It, I might. I, I, I'm not sure, really. Right. Well, so it, be, it won't be a legal marriage unless it's consummated. Right. But I mean, in terms, of, I was just trying to work out um, the, the parameters of what we're talking about with Ben here, because you are talking, therefore, about the possibility of forming relationships with people which don't mm. include sex. Yeah. So close relationships with another person, a partnership of some of some kind. That's a possibility, is it? Yeah, it could be. Right. And, and what about the what about the heartache part of it? Because what what I think David from London, when he asked this question, is trying to put his finger on is that sense of yearning and uh, loss that we feel when we're in love with somebody else which I had always been brought up to believe was partly associated with some kind of sexual urge but can you separate those two things out well yes you can I, I, I when I when I um, found myself to be asexual thought thought that as well because I was a romantic as well but uh, um, the question. <laughs> well, I was just trying to work out if you can be separate from oh, if right, you yes. feel yearning for people or you know you want to write them poetry or send them flowers yeah, or there's, there's you very can feel that when they're not in the room there's a there's a sense of absence and 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 and, and worry. I, I always thought those things were associated mm. with a sexual relationship which I'd kind of been taught to believe was love if you see what I mean. Yeah. A lot but, of uh, Avonites um, they they um, they can't they 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 say their problems of how their partner which they love most dearly uh, won't won't have a relationship and unless, if unless there is sex mm. and so they do have heartache there and I I had a yearning for friend friendship love mm. type of thing yeah. uh, when I was in depression but um, asexual people sometimes will have sex because it will it will satisfy their partner who they love most dearly yeah so so it's, a, it's a, as a result of the pressure to keep a partnership yeah. together I think Aristotle described it in his old age when he became impotent. He said it was like he'd been chained to a maniac all his life. Right. And I, and I, I thought you were going to raise Plato at this point because we're you know, talking about platonic <laughs> love here, aren't we? No, and I, I can kind of see the appeal. I was thinking about this today, and I, I partly because I'm a bit heartsick, I've split up with someone. And I could, there was a part of me that thought, yeah, I can really see the appeal of this. I mean, you know, I don't think you could choose it in the same way that you can't choose homosexuality or heterosexuality or anything else. But I think if you could, I can. I, I don't see asexuality as a hellish. Mm. I think you've been freed from an awful lot of mm, pain. Christina, is there anything else to be done ab about the sexualization of society other than supporting people like Ben? I mean, do you think there are, is, is, are you King Canute, as it were, trying to roll back a tide which has come so far in that you can't really push it back? Well, I think you can, I think you can, by, by issuing, you know, stricter regulations and by, um, I'm afraid, you know, sounding very Mary Whitehouse-ish here, um, you've got to say that the watershed stands for something. You've got to say that um, advertising should not sexualize children, at least, at least children, uh, if not all, you know, women and men. Doesn't it already? Oh, no, it doesn't. Come on. If you, if you look at uh, some of the advertising that is uh, pointedly trying to ensnare the young consumer, you can see that it is uh, it is building up the image of the of the Lolita for the girl and of the of the little stud for the boy. I mean, Can it's you give just, me a for know, instance. Mm. What? Can you give me an example? Well, um, no, because <laughs> <laughs> the, the, article, the article that I wrote was already libel lord. But I mean, I think what we what we have to what we have to consider is that we have become uh, totally obsessed with one aspect of humanity and what then and. Um, like-minded folk are reminding us of is that there's much more to life than just I that. think we should look mm. at history and see that tides come in tides go out it will change again do you think so um, Amina what do you think Amina have a word because I just wondered if you think that we are too bombarded by sexual images and, and particularly at an early age whether we're too encouraged to to become sexualized I think Christina hits it on the head there you know there, there are too many images saying if this is not where you're going then something is a little bit strange with you and but that's not necessarily for regulation because mm. I I wasn't sexually active until my very late teens and that because there was a sense of morality in all of that whilst I was exposed to the same ads and images that a lot of my peers were who are now on their third child second marriage you know I, I just feel that it's about knowing what you're comfortable with and being swayed by a distinct moral compass after that Mm. You can't really regulate. Okay, I want to bring in Roger, who's called us uh, on 0500 909 uh, from London. Hello, Roger. Hello, Matthew. Uh, well, what's your experience that's relevant uh, to this discussion? Well, I was uh, just telling you a research. Uh, we've been married 45, 46 years. Uh, over the last sort of six years, we haven't bothered with sex. Mm -hmm. None of us. I mean, I'm not really interested in that. I mean, 
I'm 57. Um, you know, I, I love it. I love my wife, and she loves me. And, and well, have you felt that that you, something has gone out of your relationship, or is the relationship as good as ever? Well, the relationship is as good as ever. I mean, we go everywhere together. We do everything. We speak. We speak. We you know, we got any problems. We we talk to each other. We've done it for the last fifty or forty odd years. Mm. But um, sex, uh, we just don't. You know, we <laughs> we rather sit there and watch a nice. A romantic movie or, or something like that. We shouldn't hold hands and cuddle mm. each other, but as for the uh, intimate, we just, just, you know, I don't know what it is, whether it's old or not like that. But, but, but what you're saying is sex isn't everything. No, it ain't. Mm. No, okay. I mean, that, that chap used to, uh, sorry to interrupt, that chap used to text earlier, 63, he has sex twice a day. <laughs> <laughs> yes, lucky man. Yeah, very yeah, surprising, but uh, there you go, we believe him. Um, yeah. But ro Roger, you know, uh, um, thank you for sharing your experience with us. Um, yeah, so, per perfectly you. possible to have a very happy marriage where there is no longer sex, it is uh, Roger's experience. Uh, somebody's um, sent me a text saying, sex isn't love, you idiot. Uh, so, uh, <laughs> point taken, I'll take that on the chin. Um, I, I don't think we're going to come to any firm conclusions here tonight, but I'm being grateful for all the people who've participated in the discussion. Christina, thank you very much indeed. Philip, thank you. Ben, thanks very much thank indeed. Uh, Anthony Bogart, thank you very much indeed for joining us um, from Canada. Um, and thanks for all your texts and emails. Um, some more there, Kate? Sex, I'd rather play on my Xbox, it's safer and cleaner, or go to the gym. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Tony That's on the so going to the gym is the excuse not to have sex now, yeah. instead of what's your excuse for not going to the gym. And Tony on the M25 says, fast downhill ski run on virgin snow, totally satisfying, no side effects, far better than sex. Right. <laughs> have you got any more? I've got two here. Um, I think one is the opposite of Kate. It says, my excuse for not going to the gym is that I was having sex instead. So much for being asexual. Right. And uh, anonymous here. I have a boyfriend whom I love, but I'm also not interested in sex at all with anyone, full stop. I really feel I could go the rest of my life without sex and not miss it. I think my partner of 10 years might be halfway there. <laughs> right, okay. Uh, Tom Bam has emailed saying, I prefer a hot cup of tea to sex, but it does make your willy sore. <laughs> right, thank you very much indeed. I'm sure Boy George gets that joke all the time. Uh, right, uh, thanks for all those comments. We'll take more if they come in. Uh, in the meantime, it's 10 to...